Thank you very much. Um, and it's a very, great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been doing, <coughs> you know, I started out my career as an academic, and I was saying to someone the other day, I'm still doing the same thing now that I did 20 years ago, but now it's not research, it's, it's business. So I think that's a good thing. It shows how the, the academia work influences the world and makes a contribution outside of the university as well as inside. So um, we're going to just kind of have a look at a variety of things, quick overview. First of all, what do we mean by enterprise ontology? There's, there's all kinds of ontologies, and we're just going to have a quick couple of seconds about you know, what that is and why we would be interested in that. And we're going to spend a lot of time on the process of building it. What's the kind of steps that we go through when we work with a company who needs an ontology? Um, and then, importantly, how to do QA. So you build the ontology, and how do you know it's correct to some extent, and what does that even mean? Uh, we had some speakers talk about that yesterday. Um, and then we'll talk about once you have the ontology, you know, how do you, how do you use that? How do you put it to, to put to work in the organization? How does it add value? And along the way, you know, I'll kind of sprinkle it with a few tips and guidelines, things that we've learned over the years. So first, who cares about enterprise ontology? Well, here are some of our clients. Mostly we work with large companies. The small companies aren't going to fork out you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for several month projects. Um, but we've worked with Sally May, it's a major um, finance um, organization in the US, Procter & Gamble, an uh, international company, LexisNexis, many of you will have heard about that legal research company. And Centara is a, is a, a, a significant size, maybe $10 billion company in the healthcare industry. And these are some of our clients. Um, so, why might any organization in general care about enterprise ontologies? Well, even aside from any IT systems, having an enterprise ontology or kind of a shared vocabulary helps everybody get on the same page. What are we talking about? I say tomato, you say tomato, the usual thing. And that really comes up in spades. When we have conversations with people at companies, you know, there's certain terms that you can just see and hear. Oh my God, there's five different ways people are using this term, and that's, that's a challenge. Um, building an enterprise ontology can be the basis for, for interoperability between existing systems. You can build maps and moving forward you can start with a common core and then systems will integrate more easily, uh, kind of for free. Um, another thing is gaining competitive advantage through early adoption of semantic technology. So what is an enterprise ontology? Well, first of all, we, we build a formal model. Now, people might build informal models, and that's fine, and that does have a use for human communication, but when we're talking about enterprise ontology, we're talking about a formal model, and we build them in OWL. We chose OWL because it's a standard. Um, now, what's the scope? This is one of the biggest challenges. You go into a big company like Procter & Gamble or LexisNexis, well, it's just gigantic. It's massive, the scope. So how do you even begin to say, well, we're going to carve off a piece? So what we aim for, again, it's a bit of a fuzzy boundary, but at least it's a reasonable, it's a helpful guideline. So all the concepts in an enterprise that are essential, what's really going on in this enterprise? What's it all about? So in the healthcare industry, it starts with a patient seeing a healthcare provider in some kind of healthcare facility, and then kind of goes out from there. Um, and so even in 50 years or 100 years from now, there's still going to be patients, there's still going to be healthcare providers, and there's still going to be facilities where healthcare is provided, okay? So the concepts that are essential, they're, they're there, they're a core part of the business, and they're stable. They're not changing all the time. So things that will be around in another 10 or 20 or 30 years. Um, that's kind of what we're aiming for. And also, we include only those concepts in there that are substantially different from one another. So you don't put every small little variation lots of little hierarchies and subtrees for the concepts. So that's kind of a, a starting point. And we try to keep it to reasonable size, you know. We try to keep it under a thousand um, classes and with properties and everything else it sometimes gets up to 1,500, maybe 2,000 concepts. Um, and we think of it as a semantic foundation for your company. If you start with the shared agreement understanding of all the important things in your company that are stable, that aren't going away, okay, then that's a foundation for your organization. Oops. 
Now here's a nice analogy that my boss, um, Dave McComb, came up with. By the way, we're a small consultancy, Semantic Arts, with three or four of us working full time. Um, and the core expertise in the company for its first several years of existence was um, enterprise architecture. So we go into a company, we help them reduce complexity and have more efficient operations by looking at what they do now and then saying, okay, that's nice. There's some inefficiencies here. Here's how it could work in the future, okay? Um, so here's an example with houses, all right? So, and the, the photograph here is the cover of a book how, called How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand. And he talked about having a house layered in such a way that so certain things can change without affecting other things, right? So the foundation of a building, the site that it's on, will virtually never change, okay? The picture in the, in the cover of the book there shows two buildings, if I could find my, I guess I can't point. Anyway, so the, building, the pictures on the upper right is the exact same building in New Orleans, maybe 100 years followed by the other one, okay? It's the same site, same infrastructure, um, but the systems inside, they will have gutted everything and put in new electrics, maybe new plumbing, okay? Um, and then there's the skin, the outer, which could change and has changed. Um, and then the space inside, right down to your individual furniture, okay? So there's an analogy here with computer systems. So the enterprise ontology can operate as the foundation for you know, your company's uh, infrastructure. Um, and then the structure would be analogous to the enterprise architecture. What are all the different pieces and how do they fit together? Systems could be kind of a formal taxonomy. So you have the, the core things and then for each major thing, sometimes it spins out into a large taxonomy. In a manufacturing organization, you might have a taxonomy of you know, functions for different kinds of things or a taxonomy of product types. The skin might be analogous to capabilities. What are the different things that you can do? Right, and then the, the navigation and search, which will change much more frequently. So the idea is the closer you are to the foundation, the less frequently things change. And you want to architect things so that you can change the outer layer without affecting the inner layer. And finally, you know, aesthetics, uh, user interface, and things like that. So we're going to spend maybe half of our time exploring one particular um, case study with the healthcare company, and then we're going to move on to some more general things about using ontologies and doing QA. So we got a contract with Centera, East Coast, uh, Virginia area, healthcare company, forward thinking. They were one of the earliest, um, if not the first, healthcare company that had a secure employee portal. So the guy that we worked with, kind of like the visionary in the company, he had a lot of street cred because he, he said way back when, we need a, a kind of an internal web presence. And so he sees the value and he convinced others that this is valuable, the semantic tech. And so their first step would be to build the enterprise ontology to have the, the foundation for their company. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you build the enterprise ontology? What do I do in my day-to-day -day work? Okay, so first we have to aim at the right target, and then we need to know how to shoot. So what's the right target? Just to repeat, you know, all and only those concepts that are stable and essential to your business um, and of course you want it to be accurate, no mistakes, easy to use, which means easy to learn and understand. And I want to underscore what um, Martin Hepp said yesterday. Very, very important. If business people and somewhat less technically sophisticated people than the technology designers are going to be using this thing, it really is critical that people can understand it. So how do we shoot? How do we hit this target? Um, a variety of steps. So first we go into the organization, we, get, we gather the experts in a given area, and then we interview them. And then we take that information and we go into our in-house tool, a modeling tool, and we create an OWL ontology. And then we export that into OWL, load it up into Protege, run inference to do the checking, and then we kind of have the debug cycle. So we just go round and round. Um, so that would be after one interview for one area of the business. And then we go back again next month and then we do a few more areas of the business. And then we just kind of rinse and repeat. Okay, so that's the big picture, how we go about doing this. <coughs> so let's have a look at the interview process. So the first thing is to really identify the scope. So we, the first meeting is not so much interviews as 
more just saying, well, tell us a little bit about your business, what are the core areas, and to make a decision about what interviews to conduct. And then they have to go to contact their internal experts and get people's schedules, et cetera. Um, and a really, really critical thing is we're not focusing on what's going on with any of their IT systems. We really want to divorce ourselves from what's currently going on in their IT systems and focus on what's going on in their company, those essential and stable concepts. Because 5, 10, 20 years down the line, most of the IT systems will be different. So we don't want to be tied into that. Um, now, there are exceptions. Sometimes you might, something might be true and important in the company, but if it never is impacted by any IT system, if it's never going to be in any IT system, well, maybe we don't really need to worry about it. So that would be a, an, ex an exception. So the interviews are fun. We get the, the best and brightest people in the company. They come and they share their understanding of what's going on. We ask lots of questions. Um, so typically we'll get you know, five to 10, up to a dozen experts for a given interview. Um, and we consciously bring in a variety of different perspectives. We don't want all one people from the same group. Bring someone in from manufacturing, bring someone in from insurance, bring someone in from you know, the, the different areas of the business. Because that's when you identify these different perspectives. So some people talk about something from one perspective, and then you realize there's a completely different perspective over here, and that's why you need to bring in the multiple points of view. So the sessions are generally tend to be quite lively, and the people enjoy them. They always walk out of the room kind of lively, and I think that was kind of neat because they learned a few things, and we asked questions that they hadn't been asked before. So in this particular case, we had about 36 hours of interviews altogether. And again, about 100 people, different experts around the company from different areas. So then the trick is getting to that bedrock, OK? So the enterprise ontology is going to be you know, the semantic foundation for your company. So how do you get to that semantic foundation? Well, one is to kind of set aside predetermined ideas. We do a little dance between how much research should we do? Should we go to Wikipedia or read about healthcare or healthcare insurance or manufacturing, wherever we're going? Or do we want to just come in with a completely open mind? It's a bit of a trade-off. You don't want to appear stupid, even though you don't know a lot about a given industry. Um, but you also don't want to kind of put, fill your brain with pre predetermined ideas. You want to have to be open to what um, your client is telling you. Um, and another really critically important thing that I learned from the group way back in the 90s when we built this generic enterprise ontology, let's focus on the concepts that are going on and try to see past the terms. Okay, a really important thing. Um, and then, what are the essential characteristics of any given concept? So whatever it is that you're talking about, what's really essential? What makes it one of those things, okay? Um, or maybe there's a more basic concepts that needed. So you might be talking about something and realize, you know what? There's something else that's going on. I think we need to understand that first before we can really get a grip on this. Okay, so these are the kind of things that go on during these interviews. Um, and also, it's very important, sometimes if you get a bit stuck during an interview, you know, you say, well, how does this impact your business? You know, what goes on in your business that, that is important about this particular thing? So we had one whole lecture about, sorry, not lecture, one whole interview session about locations in the healthcare company. How does location affect your business? Everything from recruiting, because you want to recruit people in areas where there's not a long commute, you know, to supply chain, to where are the hospitals located, following regulations, etc. And that can tease out related concepts that, that fill out your <coughs> network of concepts for your enterprise ontology. So here's a simple example which I found, you know, quite interesting. So what is a hospital? Seems like a simple question, but it's not. Um, so is it a building? Or maybe it's a legal organization with an org structure? Um, well, patients figure in there somehow, but what really is the essence of a hospital? If we're going to build it in a formal model, we need to have a consistent agreement what we're actually talking about. So here's the flip chart. We you know, take notes while we're doing these interviews, and a few things come out. So one thing that came out was a hospital is something that's licensed. Okay, So whatever hospital is, it's licensed for a specific number of what they call registered beds providing a particular kind of service. That seemed to be the core of what it was, um, which brought out this notion of, oh, a registered bed, 
That sounds like capacity, like hotel capacity. It's not a physical bed. Okay, so that's one distinction. Um, oh, we can have more than one hospital in a single building. Ah, that's interesting. So maybe a hospital is not a building. Um, and also there's this services. There's a single services layer. That, so you have, might have three hospitals in the same building, but there's a single services layer that services all of them. So that gets a bit complicated. Um, and then there's different kinds of hospitals. So for example, there's um, you know, um, acute care, rehab, senior facilities, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's kind of, sometimes we jump up to the next layer of abstraction. We find it useful to say, well, there's something called a care facility, which has these major subcategories. Um, and then other care facilities, emergency department, you know, inside a hospital, which is affiliated with the hospital, but might be, again, another separate entity of some sort, some organizational entity. So at the end of all this, this seemed to be what was emerging. The hospital is an organization, okay, but the hospital itself might not be the legal organization. It might be kind of housed inside another legal organization. Okay, and that associated legal organization, whether it's the hospital or a larger entity, is the one that holds the license. Okay, and the license is granted by some external body, which um, is, you know, granted the right by the government or something to, to give credentials for organizations for a specific number of beds. And again, it's like a hotel capacity. Um, and the hospital occupies a building, okay? And it can occupy more than one building, or a building could, sorry, or one single hospital could be spread across a large campus and have many different buildings, okay? So that seemed to be what came out of it all. Um, so, quick question, can a hospital be both an organization and a building? Yes or no? Who's listening? <laughs> no, okay, I, I saw a no in the audience, very good. Um, okay, so this is the final clarification. I said, okay, I think I get this. Let me ask one last question. So, are you saying that I could be in one hospital, say a cancer ward or something, occupying a registered bed, and I could be wheeled across the hall into another hospital and begin to occupy another registered bed in another hospital, maybe the rehab hospital, all while I'm in the same physical bed. Yes. Great, we're there, okay? So this is the kind of interesting things that come up during our interviews. Um, so after one interview, you might have 10 or 20 flip charts where we scribbled lots of notes. Um, and we just had a look at those two so once we gather all the notes and we ask lots of questions and get to the bottom of a number of things, we go home and build out the ontology using our own in-house tool. So we author it in OWL, sorry, we author it in OWL using a, a plugin to Visio that was developed by Simon Robe. Um, and we really built this visual tool to be able to communicate to clients, because you can't really show a client protege or top grade composer or worst of all, you know, RDF XML in a, in a text file. So here's what, it, what it, we produce for hospital. Okay, so hospital, um, it's a healthcare facility. It's something, it's, it receives, it's on the receiving end of an accreditation event, okay? Um, so we have a technically precise definition and then we have a short and sweet business definition for people who don't want the details. It's a subclass of healthcare facility which is, now facility is something that's tied to a location, so that's how we tie it to a location. Um, and then this notion of accredited, so it's the receiver, it's, a hospital is on the receiving end of some accreditation event, okay, so that's an event, um, where something is recognized and granted, and know there's a generic thing. Um, and then finally there's the hospital license itself, which is the thing granted during that accreditation event, okay. So this is what we end up with informal all after having had that conversation with their experts. And then the registered bad idea is tied to the license. Okay, so the license has some specific number of registered beds that would also be tied to a particular kind of service. And just this one simple idea, what's a hospital, and what you need to define it, 
brings in a constellation of, of concepts and classes from hospitals to accreditations, credentialing organizations, you know, having a magnitude, some amount of beds, etc. And then it just goes on from there. So as far as a hospital goes, that's one way to model it, but it's certainly not the only way. If we were um, working with a shipping company who ships to hospitals as well as lots of other types of organizations, they don't really care about a hospital or registered beds. All they care about is a place. It just needs a place and address to deliver to. Okay? So again, the context is always important when you're modeling. So next, we're going to look at the process of looking at the ontology. We export into OWL, we load it up into Protege, and then we look at the, the results. So we load it into the ontology editor, we run the inference engine, and then we debug it. So every so often, less and less as time goes on, um, the ontology will be inconsistent. Usually it's a silly error. Every so often it's an interesting um, bug. So you press the button to get the explanation. And then these are actual screenshots of the different you know, um, debugging things that I ended up with. And so after time, you kind of get a little bit smart about how to, how to go through this quickly. So first you just skim through it to see an obviously wrong axiom. Most of the time it's something really obvious. You got an inverse function backwards or something like that. Um, sometimes it's not so obvious and you say, well, what did I just change? Okay, that's why of course you want, like any programming job, you want to not do too much before you check it again. Um, and sometimes you just kind of have to dig. So you might as well pick a, something that has a small number of axioms in the explanation for the error instead of a large one. It's another little heuristic. Um, and if you end up having to look through a big pile of axioms to figure out something, then try to, and often you'll get multiple explanations. Then you can look for things that are, you know, maybe a related theme or the same things appear in the multiple explanations and that's kind of a clue. And sometimes, <laughs> still scratching my head after all this, and I'll literally start drawing pictures and arrows and diagrams and, and follow the logic through to find out what's going on. And once in a while, it's not a real error. It's just some interesting consequence of how you model things, and you say, huh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, I'll buy that. And that's kind of another way that the reasoner helps you. Um, so once you've made sure your ontology is consistent, you don't have any um, problems that are logical problems, you might, then you need to look at the inferred hierarchy to see are there any inferences that I've been making that really don't make sense. Is this thing a subclass or something that just shouldn't be so? Okay, and that's another test. And then you press the explain button and then you go through the same process. I see some heads nodding, so I guess there's people who are doing this type of thing. Um, so we go through this process and then we find a few chunks of this bedrock that's going to be the enterprise ontology, that's going to be the foundation for your company's IT infrastructure. And then we cycle through the process, more interviews, more um, modeling. And in the case of the healthcare example, um, lots of different things. We talked about recruiting, you know, the participating doctors, the employees. Um, so that's a distinction in itself that had never occurred to me. They hire doctors who work in-house, but the majority of doctors that work with them, they essentially rent out the hospital space. So they're the hospital's customers is the doctors who rent out the hospital space. And they need to make the space nice, because otherwise the doctors will go to another place, right? Just like any recruiting, you want to be attractive to your potential people that are going to be working with you. Um, lots of diagnosis and treatment procedures, coordinating care, we had a whole lecture about that, sorry, not lecture, a whole interview session. Um, health insurance, a massively complicated thing in the United States. Supply chain, healthcare facilities, just to name a few. So we go through all this, we add more and more bedrock, and then the question is, what if anything is supporting that bedrock, right? So in fact, what we use is our own upper ontology. So yesterday we had some nice talks, uh, well one nice talk about um, <coughs> different foundational ontologies. This is one that most of you will have never heard of because it's never been written up in a academic paper. It was built um, by Dave McComb. Um, purely for business purposes. So just as a minimalist upper ontology designed for business people. Um, so again, another talk yesterday nicely referred to um, 
you know, a, a bunch of different foundational ontologies and why they help. So I'm going to say essentially the same thing you heard yesterday. Um, when you start with an upper ontology, instead of starting from scratch, you can build your ontology faster because you're leveraging other people's thinking, assuming they're thinking properly. Um, and also you can build a better ontology because you're starting with a solid foundation. If you start with something you know, like Dolce, who, people like Aldo who have spent half his career building, building it, or maybe three years of his career, I mean, you know that it's going to be pretty solid. Um, so that's good. So start with a solid foundation. Um, and if it's highly axiomatized, then you're going to be able to leverage the inference engine to spot these little errors that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, but which one to choose? So now again, I was very interested to see a talk yesterday just about how to choose. Now you couldn't put just in your, in your um, bag of choices because you never heard of it. Um, but why would, why would you be interested in GIST, for example, compared to the other <coughs> ontologies? Well, there's a few reasons. The biggest one for a company that was our clients is it's business friendly. Okay, so we're not um, using terms that come from philosophy that business people won't understand, that won't be natural to them, developed by business people for business people. Um, and it's simple and elegant to the extent that we possibly can. We try to keep the number of concepts as small as possible. Um, has most of what you need for a given application and not very much of what you don't. We have fewer than 300 concepts altogether, about maybe 150 classes and 150 relations. Um, and yet it's rigorous enough, so we put enough, just enough actions in to be able to reduce ambiguity, to catch some errors through inference. Um, and also, we take a lot of time to structure the ontology in such a way that it makes it easy to find the thing you're looking for, okay? Um, and again, that I want to underscore, um, I'll forget about that. So I want to underscore again what Martin said yesterday. It's very important for the ontology be, to, to be usable. So if you've got 5,000 things in it, you know, woe is you if you're the, the data person trying to create linked data. Oh my gosh, which relationship do I choose? Which property, which class? How do I know it's the right one? There's seven that seem to be about the same, right? So we try to, <coughs> you know, condense all that detail out so that it's relatively easy to use. Now there's a few engineering principles and guidelines that we use um, to help us out. So one is to have a small number of high level classes, maybe a dozen or so, that are all disjoint from one another. And then we make a concerted effort. Every single class we put in the ontology, we try to make a subclass of at least one of those. Okay? So that's one way to catch a lot of errors. Um, and we also try, again, what I said a minute ago, to try to keep the number of primitives as, as small as possible. So trying to define things in terms of other primitives rather than introduce yet new ones. Again, that reduces the, the amount of time it takes to find something if you want to encode um, some data for, for, an, for applying the ontology. So that means it's a little bit easier to learn. Um, and also, I don't know what to call this layered ambiguity, but sometimes ambiguity is good. Um, you just want to say, this company employs this person, because that's all you care about. But if you want to know more about that, if you want to know the date of the employment and who did the interview and all that stuff, now you have to have a kind of an event where you reify that relationship. So you want to be able to layer the ambiguity. So if you don't need the extra detail, have a simple relationship to just record that. But if you do need the extra detail, have a mechanism to smoothly go into that, but to still retain you know, the original relationship. So one way to do that for, say, employment is to just create a property chain, you know, to connect the employer that goes into the event and then out of the event to the person. So that's something that, that we do in a variety of different ways. Um, so how big are these ontologies? Um, here's just a visual. So we just saw that example for licensing um, and what a hospital is, hospital accreditation. So that is um, a little piece of an ontology, which is part of one section of the ontology, which is related to business, business types of things as opposed to healthcare delivery or, or regulations. Um, and that particular part, that particular thing is part of about 20 different sheets, all of which are about three feet by, well, two feet by three feet, say. Um, so the scale is pretty reasonable, um, but it's nothing like the life science ontologies. People say, 
oh, that's a big ontology. Or if I'm talking to life science people, they say, oh, that's a tiny ontology, because there's hundreds of thousands of things in the gene ontology and some of these other ones. So I guess we're middle-sized <laughs> ontology. Um, so that's a, that's a sense of it. Now here's the different areas. We touched on this briefly before. So finance, marketing, regulations, all the different aspects of the business. And these are the subject areas that, that we went into for each of the, the 12 or so interviews that we had. Um, and the bottom layer is kind of the core gist, plus sometimes we need to expand out details in, in certain areas, so we'll call those subgists <coughs> for events, finance, measures, organizations, etc. Now, how big is this? So we, we, talk, we like to talk about it as wallpaper. Okay, so get a, to get a sense of this, if you have six meters of wall space, okay, three meters high, then when we print out the model, that's how much space it takes up, okay? So you look at it in Protege and you don't get a sense of that, right? Um, so as far as we know, I don't know for sure, um, that this is the first and only comprehensive ontology for healthcare delivery and insurance. Um, there's lots of life science ontologies for diseases and this, that, and everything else. And I saw a very small start at a healthcare delivery ontology, but as far as we know, this is the only um, substantial effort in that area. Um, now, for this particular company, we completed this work in February last year, and then um, in the middle of the year, we helped them build out a prototype um, to kind of like <coughs> to, to do a, a linked up, linked data mashup, so they had asthma data, kind of historical data, and then they would have um, the, the, the pollen count, okay, and then they could use that to automatically, you know, forward warnings to people who they knew had asthma problems. So um, that's what they're doing. And we're working with them. Hopefully next year we'll, they'll have, they have another project that will help them with. Um, so there's a few interesting representation challenges that are worth um, noticing and commenting on briefly. So. One is kind of in the recruiting side of things. We came up with this idea of, you know, well, we didn't come up with the idea, but we, we ran into the question of how do you represent skills, capabilities, because doctors have to be registered for certain things, have to have certain abilities, or an auditor has to be able to do the auditing, but are they registered? So there's actually a bunch of different distinctions. You know, what does an underwriter say? Is it someone who has permission to underwrite? In other words, they have legal credentials to do so? Um, or is it someone, who's practicing. So you might have legal credentials 20 years ago. Does that mean you say I'm an underwriter? Well, maybe not, okay? You're not really practicing anymore. Um, or maybe you are practicing, or maybe you're capable of it, but you don't have any credentials, right? Or maybe you're experienced, you've actually done it and got paid for it, right? So there's like four different ways of looking at what it means to be an underwriter. That's quite ambiguous, okay? So again, this principle of layered ambiguity, you wanna be able to just have the ability to say, I'm an underwriter, without having to commit to which of those variations it is, right? But you also need to be able to get down to the, to the details if, if you need to. So we built a simple, um, simple way to, to capture that. Um, okay, uh, another thing that comes up over and over again, of course, is you know, how to control or influence behavior in some way. So if you're an employee, working for Sentara, you like to say, send me my money this way. Put it, deposit it in this bank account or send me a check to this address. And that's your preference and you're saying, this is what I want you to do when you, when you give me my paycheck. Um, or informal recommendations and guidelines. Here's how we prefer for you to do certain types of things. Or care instructions. You go in for an operation, they give you a list of paper that says, do this, do this, don't do that, okay? Um, and then there's formal processes and procedures, registering, where everything has to be done just so. Um, health insurance billing, oh my God, what a nightmare that is, at least in the US. Um, contracts and agreements, all kinds of things. That's again, this influences your behavior. You sign a contract, now you have to do certain things, you may not do other things. Offers, medical products, you say, I will sell you this, and then you put that offer out there. If somebody responds, then that means you have to behave in a certain way, you have to honor that offer. Um, laws and regulations, et cetera. Um, so what do all these have in common? That's a lot of different things, okay? So we came up with a, a kind of a model that captures the common essence of all those things. Um, first of all, they're produced by people or organizations. An organization will publish something that says, this is how you must do things. Um, 
And they usually have, they'll have some scope. They apply to some persons or some organizations. You must do it this way or you must not. To achieve one or more goals, there's, almost, there's always going to be some reason for putting it into place. Um, and kind of like the, the raw materials, the guts of any attempt to control or influence behavior seems to be involving at least, you know, this seems to be covering 99% of what's going on. It's either permission to do something or it's a restriction, you shouldn't do it, or you're required to do something, or it's more suggested that you do it. Okay, so we kind of capture this, um, this commonality. Um, another thing that came up which is quite interesting and very broad and hard to do in a good way, um, and I'm not saying I've solved the problem, um, but so many kinds of goals arise. So the branding department you know, has the goal that some target population believes things about the company. Right? A sales department has a different kind of goal. Their goal is that somebody buys something. Right? Um, patients have personal health goals that they want to achieve. You know, blood pressure or weight or degree of fitness. Um, an education goal is you know, to know something. I want to get educated because I really want to know how to do ontology engineering, for example. Um, so there's always going to be, for all these different kinds of goals, this goal is going to relate to something. It's going to be somehow part of some topic. And then it's going to be who has the goal, right? And then the goal is actually directed at something. So I might have the goal that my son gets a, 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 you know, a degree in, or becomes a lawyer, okay? Or a designer of a material might have the goal that putting this feature in the product, you know, will, will affect the product in this beneficial way. Um, and then there's the substance of the goal, kind of like the meat of the goal. It's really a state. My goal is that something is the case, right? But if you go down, peel that one layer back, what is it that you have a goal about? It's really to do something, to have something, to be something, or you might have the goal to know something or even to believe something. Um, so my parents had this goal that I believed in Jesus Christ, the Savior. That's really what they wanted. Um, but th and then it's to know or believe something. So then there's the something. Um, so that's kind of a few of the interesting representational challenges that we come up with that seem to be quite broad and they'll cover a variety of different industries. They're going to come up. The goals are going to come up. Um, influencing behavior is going to come up, etc. So the next thing I want to talk about is how to QA the ontology. Again, we had a nice talk yesterday. Lots of different ways that you could have errors collecting a lot of results from papers that have been written. So we've started to do a little bit of that. But here's a few dimensions along which QA can happen for an ontology. One is, is it correct? Are there errors? We touched on that a little bit before. Another one is, how, can it, how easily can it be learned and understood? And to what extent can we say it's complete? And how would we even get a sense of that? How would we begin to get our hands around that? Um, so there's a variety of techniques that contribute to each of these, and we'll just look at a few. So what makes us think the ontology is correct? Um, well, one is you run the inference engine. And if it's inconsistent, then there's at least something that's incorrect. It might be a trivial thing, but at least you have to fix those. Okay? And again, as we said before, manually look at all the inferences in the inferred hierarchy to kind of do a, a spot check to see, does this even make sense? And another incredibly important thing which is also very time consuming, is to you know, build out test data. So I think I have this nice representation for, mal for goals or functions, and I try to explain it to somebody, and they're like, oh man, I don't get that. Oh, let me show you how to do that. And then I'm like, oh, hmm, I didn't quite get that right. So it really forces the issue. You think you got something modeled nicely, prove it to yourself, prove it to others by modeling out some instances. <coughs> um, Another way, another thing to do, and again, this, this feeds right into that talk we had yesterday um, about oops, right? How many different ways uh, can you make a mistake in building your ontology? Let me count the ways. 29, we had 29 that were uh, found in the, the literature. So we started doing a little bit of that in a pretty ad hoc way. I noticed a handful of things, some of which were mentioned in yesterday's talk, um, and I just write Sparkle queries and manually cut and paste. Um, but I'm really kind of excited to, to use that tool because it's just going to save, save me a lot of time. Um, and again, ask the client. So you build something. How do you know it's correct? Ask the client, what do they think? Um, 
So, however, what do you do? How do you, how do, you do that? What do you show the client? That's not easy, that's not obvious. Um, and we dove into that murky world of visualization and graphic displays of ontologies, and I thought after all these years there would be any number of things that were quite suitable. Um, but it turns out that they really aren't um, for our purposes. There's lots of cool things that tools do, but each tool has its own little area of expertise, but it doesn't do the other thing that the other tool does, okay? Or, or you can make changes and then it won't save the changes. And so it turns out there really isn't, at this time, I'm sorry to say, you know, really good solid visualization tools that are easy to use, open source or, or you know, commercial tools that you can buy that are properly supported and are pretty robust. Um, in fact, Simon Robe, in our, uh, my colleague in our company, he gave a talk, Adventures in Visualization, where he went into this in some detail at Semtech last year. Um, so here are some simple options, what to do. So one is to show them our wallpaper, okay, the, the, we, we model it by drawing pictures. Um, so that's somewhat easy to understand. I can take someone who's somewhat technical, walk them through those pictures that we saw earlier about hospital, and you can relatively quickly kind of get the rough idea there. That's one. And then there's HTML docs. There's lots of tools out there. We usually use Top Braid Composer to export the, the docs, but there's other tools out there. And this is just kind of like you click, click around and that's a way to navigate. And we also played around with another tool called View. Um, and this was manually generated. So you really want to be able to do automatic generation so that when you change ontology, you don't have to manually change everything again. But that's very challenging. Um, so what are the sorts of things that you want to be true about a good visualization system? Well, it wants to be, minim it wants to be intuitive. You don't want to have to go into large, long explanations. Oh, here's what this way of laying it out means. Um, and you also want it to be dynamic or almost fractal. So whatever degree of you know, general, generalness or specificness you're looking at, you want it to be able to kind of dynamically expand or contract. Um, and also you want it to be persistent, so tolerant of change, kind of like done, you know, re, rerun it again. It needs, of course, to be inference aware, um, easily distributable so you can port things on the web, friendly for layout, and also just kind of like the, uh, the nebulous appealing. When you look at it, you just want to say, oh, that's nice in some sense. Um, so those are some of the Criteria. Now we tried an experiment, which <laughs> you would agree with us failed. <laughs> okay, we thought, well, let's see if this works. Well, it didn't. Um, so another thing that works well, but it's also very time consuming and it has to be redone every time the ontology changes um, significantly. I've X'd out all the details here. This is from one of our recent clients. Um, but this is like the core essence of that model, which had several hundred things in it. This is like 25 things. Um, and that's really the essence. Basically, if you look at this, now you got 80% of what you need to know from a high level about it. So that's another way that you can help people understand the model. Um, so that's kind of like a work in progress. Now another thing that's um, ugh, terminology, it's just always, always so annoying. So people use terms differently as we know. Um, and one thing that we noticed is, and you kind of get a sense of this as you're listening to people talk in a company, you start realizing, oh, they're using this term, but all they're really doing is using the term that this system dictates that they use. And that term might actually come from the vendor. It might not even be the company term, right? So then you have to tease that out with, well, what's that term really referring to? That's really challenging. Um, so our target is to come up with terms that meet this criteria. So anyone in the enterprise should be able to look at that term and get a, some reasonable sense of what it means, right? Who, so someone needs to know what's going on, but that person shouldn't have to be familiar with any of the specific systems, okay? So this is just a target that we try to hit, and it's not, it's not easy. Um, one thing we do is if there's an ambiguous term, if I see that there's a term that, that I, I, I know that those five people are using it differently, I just won't use that term in the ontology. I'll use a long term that's not very nice, really, but, and then I just kind of leave it open. I say, you know what, eventually we're going to hand, oh, excuse me, eventually we'll hand this off and it will be yours and you will maintain it and curate it and you can figure out the terms that you want, 
right? But that's kind of a, a challenge, an ongoing challenge. Um, so another thing is use cases to check for completeness. So if the ontology is going to serve a purpose to help your organization move forward with its kind of as a foundation for IT systems, then it should cover some important use cases. So we recently did this exercise. So we asked the client, what are the kinds of challenges you have? What can't you do now that you would like to be able to do? And then that identifies a handful of use cases, okay? And also the data linkages. Why can't you do that? Well, we can't do it. Often the answer is because this data is over here, this data is over here, and we can't, you know, glue these things together. Um, so these ideas become ideas for future prototypes because we can now maybe build a system that does those things that you can't easily do now. And then we ask them to focus on the data because we we're building an ontology because they're going to represent you know, data in the organization which uses the concepts from the ontology. Um, and we want to ensure that the ontology is going to support the important data that they need. So that's the sense in which this is an exercise to help ensure completeness. Um, so typically, uh, maybe I'll just skip through this quickly. Um, for data modeling, you usually start from scratch. You design the data models independently from each application. You maintain them independently. And if there is conceptual overlap, you don't know about it, it's not leveraged, then you keep doing the same work over and over again. And then when you do need to interoperate, then it's expensive, ETL, blah, blah, blah. Um, so when you have the ontology, the idea is you don't have to start from scratch. Right? When you build your data model, once you have the semantic foundation, you can start looking there. Even if it's just a human being looking as opposed to any automated system. Right? And the data models are now designed from that common core. Okay? which is maintained in one place and specialized as needed. And where there is overlap, okay, you don't have to recreate it multiple times, right? And the applications will share that model and therefore they will interoperate to some extent for free. To the extent that they start with the same heritage, interoperability and doing the mapping is, is a non is a non starter. I mean it's not a, it's, it's not an issue. You don't have to worry about it. So then what we do is we so we identify some number of use cases and then we'll just go through them one by one and actively engage the client to say, okay, this is a group participation exercise. We want you to consider the following. First look at this high level overview that we, we saw the picture of a few minutes ago. And then for each use case that we identified, you look in this high level overview um, or so first we characterize the use case in the following way. What's the goal? What do you want to be able to achieve? And what are the inputs and outputs? And then what's the data you need um, to, to get that? Um, and then you look at the overview picture because you can't show these people, you know, protege and they can't be searching around. You just have to have the basics up there. Um, and then they see, well, what's missing and what's there? And then, you know, identifying the data linkages. So once you go through this exercise, right, for a given use case, here's the data that we need and here's how this data needs to be connected together. Now you look at the ontology and you say, well, is it there? And are those connections there? Yeah, five minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, so that's kind of the, the process we go through there. All right, so we're gonna skip through a few things in use of time. Um, all right, so we're, we're pretty much on track. Um, so we do this exercise to help ensure that the ontology has covered the scope adequately, and then we'll identify gaps, okay? So then you feed back to the developers and then we fill in those gaps. Uh, as necessary. Now, stepping away from the specifics of the ontology, how do you exploit the ontology kind of in general? So the ontology is meant to be the least common denominator, relatively small, just a few hundred concepts in it um, to link between different um, systems. But there's a number of different ways to leverage the ontology. And they have different relationships to other systems. So Simon and our, our company um, came up with a, a nice, really simplified view of this Zockman um, diagram, which has, like, Zockman framework has lots of rows and lots of columns. It's quite confusing. Um, so we came up with something much simpler, a tic-tac-toe model, for obvious reasons. <coughs> and there's two dimensions here. One is abstraction, and the other one is perspective. We'll just have a look at that in a minute. So in the abstraction dimension, we have data, metadata, and then categories of metadata. So Johnny Cochrane, a human being, okay, the metadata is Johnny Cochrane is an attorney, 
So he's a member of that category. But what is the, the concept attorney? What's that a member of? What, what kind of a thing is that? Okay, well, that's kind of metadata. That would be a legal role type, or it might be an owl class. Okay, so it's kind of like in that direction, you're talking about either is it data, is it the metadata, is it the meta metadata, classes, instances, language constructs. That's what we're talking about there. The other dimension is perspective, or the way I like to think about it is the degree to which you're moving closer to implementation and further away from real world. Okay? So on the top is real world conceptual and the bottom is implementation. So the classic example there is conceptual models, logical models, physical models for in your database world. Okay? Um, but you might also, not in, in not databases per se, you can think of it as, well, here's the real world things going on, and here's some design decisions we're making for a particular application, and then here's how we're implementing it. Okay? So when we, when we break up the world this way, um, it's actually very helpful to our clients to understand you know, where, the, where the ontology fits in. So here's a few simple ways that you can use the ontology, kind of abstract um, architectural ways. Um, so let's say you have the semantic model, and again, it's sitting in this, sorry, you can't see where I'm poking, let's see, this upper middle section, right? And this is the, 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 the classes, the concepts and categories and properties, right? So that's a semantic model, that's the, the place in this um, framework that sits. So suppose you're building a new system, an implemented system, okay, using the semantic model. Now, if you use the ontology to help build that system, okay, now it's going to be simpler and cheaper because you didn't have to start from scratch. You're starting from the ontology, which already distills out the essence of the organization. Okay, now if you build a second system, right, it's going to be easier to interoperate because they, even if it's just the human being, right, they started from the same core, so it's going to be less work to glue them together later. Um, another way to do this is to do some form of transformation. Could be partially automated, could be fully automated, could be fully manual, um, but we're thinking more semi-automated here. So you have a new system, number one, um, and then you generate the schema automatically from the semantic model, and that now becomes the schema for your new application. And if you have a second application, okay, you're going to generate another schema for that, and the scope may be different. So, but again, where there's the overlap, it's going to be easier to leverage that in making the future integration easier. Okay, another approach which we've actually used in um, Sally May, this is the finance organization. Um, so you have the semantic model and you want to build some applications, you can use the ontology to build the message model, okay, for, for SOA messages. Um, and now you have um, a, a nice set of SOA messages that all the systems share, and that's another way to leverage the ontology. Um, and a, the last way is if you like direct implementation. So this example of this would be, let's just take the ontology exactly as it is. We're not going to transform it into anything. It's fine the way it is, and we're just going to populate it with data. Okay, so this is one way that you could use ontology organization to, kind of, it could be linked data. So now we have the ontology, we have lots of information for all these systems, let's suck it into some great big triple store, and then we can, we can work with it. So that's a third way. Um, so, I guess I'm almost on time here. Um, so that's kind of a nice little trip to give you guys um, a sense of what we do in industry. And I hope that some of you are inspired to go on from your PhD student lives and, and go come into business and help make a difference in the world. Um, so, concluding thoughts, summary. Enterprise ontology is really starting to take off now, um, which is very satisfying to me personally. Um, and large companies are starting to see the value, and they're putting out the resources to get that value. Um, and there's always a problem of commercial confidentiality, what people are willing to say. And there are, we are starting to see um, more and more really big, important use cases in semantic tech more generally, the BBC, Garlic, uh, Amdocs. There's a handful of really high-profile systems that are really large-scale, robust industrial implementations but they don't seem to have much of an ontology role, and not enterprise ontology role, right? So, but I'm thinking that, you know, before too long, uh, we're gonna start seeing some of those. Um, modulo commercial confidentiality. There may be 
probably things going on at the moment. So the short story is, you know, we've got plenty of work. We've got more and more things in the pipeline. Lots of different industries you know, come to us and other vendors. Um, so the future is bright. So thank you very much. <laughs>